one? All right, it's been a little while for me. Um, <clears throat> it's a privilege to be here with you this morning. As uh, Pastor Nathan said, we, uh, we are members at Harvest Berry. Uh, I got to say, uh, as nice as the backs of all your heads look week by week as I'm down there with you, it's nice to see the front of your heads too. Uh, thank you. Uh, for, for the privilege um, of being members here with you, over the last couple years, uh, one of the deepest means of grace of sustaining our faith uh, for myself and for my family has been that you have been to us, what Pastor Nathan said at the beginning, uh, uh, <laughs> we're a group of people, we're ignorant and rebellious, we're weary, we're wayward, we're sinful, all that stuff, but we, as much as we're all like that, we know where to come, I keep coming back to Jesus. And you have welcomed us as fellow messy sinners into your midst, and that has been a huge blessing to me. Another privilege to me is just the ability to be with you right now and to do what I know you love, because I'm here every week, uh, which is get into the Word of God together. So we're going to do that, as Pastor Nathan said, in Mark chapter 4. And as you open up there, I'll ask you a question. Are you now, or have you at any time in your life ever been, an insider? Sounds cool, right? I mean, if you think about it, that's most glorious. The insiders are the people we see on the sports shows at like trade deadlines or draft day or whatever, and they have the fancy suits and they got all the rumors and all the, the inside scoop on things. Or if you watch like Entertainment Weekly or whatever those shows are, the entertainment ones where they know about all the celebrities and all the gossip and they've got the inside scoop, the insiders, they, they look fancy. That's kind of the glorious way of thinking about it. For most of us, really, though, like practically being an insider in our life means like we get that email from The Gap each week that says like, hey, you're an insider because you signed up for your 10% off your first order or whatever, and now you get the email every week for the rest of your life. Uh, those marketers, they, they, they know what they're doing, right? By promising to make you an insider, it appeals to something in us. They, they know that we want to be insiders because they know that the reality is that for most of us, most of our life, we actually spend feeling like outsiders. Like if we stop and reflect, we're somehow on the cusp of something great or something at least better than what we have that other people seem to have, they seem to know something, they seem to have some kind of secret of this is how to do it, this is how life works, this is how you get the things, this is how you get the friends, this is how you get the influence, whatever it may be, the position at work, and we're just on the outside. And we spend so much of our life trying to figure out how to get into that next inner circle, that next inner ring, moving in closer and closer, trying to get, trying to uncover what's the secret to get in there the reality is that that longing exists in all of us because we are all born on the outside of the greatest thing, which is the kingdom of God. The, the kingdom that Jesus comes to proclaim in Mark's gospel as he's, as he's begun preaching, or as Mark's begun recording the gospel through the first four chapters, he's told these stories of Jesus calling people to himself, these stories of Jesus performing miracles. And gathering a crowd, a crowd of insiders. At one point, he calls them family. Uh, he calls some specific ones to be apostles, close followers. Who, who are the insiders? This, this has been the surprising thing of the first four chapters of Mark, is that the people that you would expect to be the insiders aren't. The ones who are coming to Jesus, who are joining his kingdom, who are becoming a part of it, they're the lepers, the unclean, the outsiders. They're the ones with demons. The prostitutes, the tax collectors, the sinners, the messy ones. Those are the ones that are coming in. And the ones that you would have thought would be in, the religious people, the influential, the powerful, the elite of society, are turning away and rejecting and proving themselves to be, in fact, outsiders. We see the heart of Jesus in this passage as he's going to give the image of a sower sowing the seed. He's scattering the seed. He's taking the message everywhere, even to the furthest corners, the most unlikely corners, and scattering the seed and calling whoever, if you would, come in. Come into this kingdom that welcomes the sinners, that welcomes the broken, where there is life and truth and beauty and goodness and wholeness and the promise of eternity and new creation where you will be with him forever. He's calling whoever would come to come. 
He's giving them the secret to become an insider in his kingdom. Our, our simple statement this morning is this, inside, or rather we all remain outsiders to the kingdom unless God's grace brings us in. But we want to make it more personal. <laughs> How do we get that? How does that grace come to me? His, this grace comes to me as I, first of all, come to hear the word for what it is. As I come to hear the word for what it is, this is what Jesus lays out for us, an authoritative word from a king with power to divide or to upset and to reveal the truth, both about his kingdom, but also about us. Let's see it in the text, verse 1. He began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat at it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. So you can picture this scene. It seems very, uh, it's, it's simply set up. The crowds are coming to him. Um, my grandfather played an accordion. I don't know how many of you even know what an accordion is, but it's one of those instruments that looks like an organ that you carry around and you, you get it out big and then you squeeze it. If, if you imagine that pattern, this is kind of like how Jesus' ministry is going. So Jesus performs miracles and the crowds come. There's all kinds of them. They're swelling around. They're pressing in on every side because they like the miracles. So what does he do? He gathers the crowd and then he teaches and the teaching squeezes <laughs> so that the crowds get small again because lots of people don't like it and they leave. But here, he's prepared the stage. He's gathered the crowd with all of the miracles. They've gathered around him, and he has to get on a boat so that he can have space to teach and to preach, and he proclaims. And if you've ever been on a sh beach shore, like near the water, or if you're out on the water, and you've ever tried to tell a secret to a friend while you're on the water, and then you realize later that everyone on the shore could hear you, like, that's an embarrassing moment, right? That's just how sound works. For some reason, it travels across water. Jesus is using it to his advantage. So he is on the water, on the lake, on the boat, and he's proclaiming so that the thousands of people who've gathered can hear his teaching as he explains it to them. And, and as he was teaching, verse 2, he was teaching them many things in parables, which, as we said, is the squeezing. The disciples don't understand the why of the parables. Seems like Jesus is making it confusing for people. Seems like it's chasing people away. So they're going to ask him about that in this passage. But in his teaching, in his parables, he said to them, verse 3, Listen, behold. That's weird. Listen, behold. Look, listen, listen, see, look, look, listen. He's trying to draw your attention to something. If there's an awkward statement like that that doesn't need to be there, it's good to pay attention, right? Jesus could have started out by saying a sower went out to sow. That would have been fine. Why does he include the listen and the behold? It's for emphasis. He's trying to get all your attention to this. Are you listening? And then he tells the story. A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil. Immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. When the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns. The thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. And he said to them, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Remember how he began? Listen, behold, look at how he ends. Hear, if you have ears to hear, hear. Jesus is emphasizing how you hear. He's trying to get your attention. Verse 10, when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parables. They asked him about the parables. Matthew's gospel makes this clear. When they came to ask him about the parables, they, they basically said, why? <laughs> why are you doing this? Why are you speaking in parables to this crowd? Jesus gives this answer. He said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. To you. For those outside everything is in parables. To you, secret, kingdom, 
insiders to them, parables hidden outsiders, so that, verse 12, they may indeed see, but not perceive, may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. Understand what Jesus is saying here. The sower sows the same seed. The disciples are, are, are almost saying to Jesus, why aren't you giving good enough seed? You're speaking in parables. And Jesus is saying, no, no, there's nothing wrong with the seed. The same seed is being scattered everywhere. For the insiders, it's the secret. They receive it as the secret of the kingdom of God. And they join my kingdom. The outsiders reject it. They refuse it. And they walk away. They do not understand. This is, this is a bit puzzling. I mean, it's puzzling on many levels, right? It, it's puzzling at least on this level. You're asking, what is the difference? What is the difference between the insiders and the outsiders that it would be either parables or secrets, that it would be revealed or not? Well, here's what it's not. The difference is not that the disciples have some kind of spiritual wisdom, insight, understanding, some kind of maturity about them, some kind of righteousness in them. They don't get it any more than the outsiders did. That's the reason why they're asking. They too are clueless. Jesus, what's up? Well, I'm telling in parables because the outsiders don't understand, but we don't understand. So what's the difference? The difference is they humble themselves to ask. They don't understand, they don't get it, but they go to the one with the answers and they look to him for grace. He said to them in verse 13, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? And the answer is that God's grace comes to us as we come to Christ, as we come to Christ in need, as we come to Christ to receive his word for what it is. Now we're talking a lot about parables, and specifically here the word comes to us in the form of parables, but it's worth asking, because as Pastor Nathan said, we're going to be spending the summer in parables. What, what are parables? How are we supposed to think about them? Well, let's try to build something of a working definition here. Parables, parables are, at the very least, they're riddle-like sayings or stories. Now, I think it's important that we point out that they're sayings or stories, because sometimes when you think about the parables, you immediately think of stories, right? Think of like uh, the prodigal son. Uh, you think of the good Samaritan. And these are stories that capture our imagination, that capture our minds, that live on, even outside the church. If you're outside the church and you say to someone, oh, he's a real good Samaritan, or, or like the prodigal has come home, everyone knows what you're talking about, because the, the stories almost take on a life of themselves. So parables are sometimes stories, but sometimes they're just sayings. I'll give you a few examples. Here's one. Matthew 13, verse 33. He told them another parable kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. That's it. That's the parable. One sentence. Here's another one. Matthew 13, verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Okay, two sentences. Still one verse. There's sayings or stories that are, are riddle-like, which means a couple things. Uh, on one level, it just means there's a deeper meaning. There's, there's a meaning that you've got to get to. There's a nut you've got to crack. There's, there's a punchline that's got to come. There's a plot twist at the end. There's something to be revealed. There's a treasure to be found for those who are willing to dig. There's a surprise in it for you if you stick around and look for it. They're also riddle-like in, in this way. Um, riddles are kind of like dad jokes. You either like them or you're weird. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, I'm a dad. I'm allowed to say it. Okay, riddles, riddles what they do uh, is they divide people. So if you've ever told a riddle, you understand immediately the responses you get from people, right? You're excited to tell the riddle and you start to share it and then there's, there's a one person that's immediately like, I gotta get out of here. Like, I am not interested in this riddle at all and I just, I don't care. I'm not gonna guess at your riddle. Like, I don't know it. How am I gonna know it? And they're trying to get out. But then there's other people that are so on board. Like, they are all in on this riddle and they're thinking about it. They're like, don't tell me, don't tell me, don't tell me. And they're thinking about it all day. They're gonna work it over till they come up with the answer themselves. 
Telling the riddle didn't make those people that way. They already were that way. You telling the riddle just showed you what type of person they were. So Jesus, when he tells the parables, is drawing out various responses, revealing who the people are that he is talking to. And you can picture this another way, right? If, if I said to you this morning, there is gold. <laughs> I know it's there. I've seen it. There is gold. And there's a lot of it, like millions of dollars worth. And it is, it is buried treasure. It is in the beach. It's the beach this way? I get confused. It, it's in the beach. And, and it's there. And, and it's there for the taking. For whoever gets there, digs it out, finds it. It is yours. Millions of dollars. It's right there. Go get it. There'd be different responses. There's not actually gold, by the way, just in case you were wondering. There'd be different responses. Some of you, if you believed me, you're like, I need the gold. I don't care if I look like an idiot. And I was trying to get out of church early anyway. So I'm out of here. And you would take off right now. Uh, you, you, you know, it's like, I'll, I'll go buy a metal detector, a Canadian tire. I don't care if I look silly. You know, if you're one of the people that carries the metal detectors at the beach, you do look silly. I get it, but you do look silly. Okay, so I don't care if I look silly. You're over it. You just go because you want the treasure and you're going to do what it takes to find it. And others of us were way too concerned with what people would think of us. And so I'm not going to look like an idiot. I'm not going to look like I'm being taken in. And I don't believe you anyway. What are you even talking about gold? That's weird. Saying the statement doesn't make you the way you are. It just draws the response out from your own heart. Parables are, are riddle-like sayings or stories that reveal. They reveal us for who we are, but they also reveal the truth about the kingdom of God, which means if we understand the parables to be sayings of the king about the kingdom, then they are declarations that are non-negotiable. They are authoritative they are commanding. You know who has a right to declare what his kingdom will be like? The king. You know who doesn't? Everyone else. Like me. It's not a democracy. It's a kingdom. And when Jesus comes on the scene and makes declarations about what his kingdom will be, it's, it's him who declares. And it is authoritative. Here's an example. Matthew chapter 13, verse 47 Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea. And it gathered fish of every kind. And when it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. If I'm honest with you, there's some stuff about that parable that I don't particularly like. But if I'm really honest with you, it does not matter what I like. Because it's the truth. Parables confront us with authoritative reality that we will either submit to or not, that we will accept or reject, but they will stand as the rules of the kingdom And it'd be fine if the king came, right, and just said all the things that we like. Um, I, th I, think it was, I, th I think it was Tim Keller said something like, uh, if you find that your God never disagrees with you, you're probably just worshiping an idealized version of yourself. <laughs> it's worth thinking about. The problem is when he comes and declares these parables and we understand the meaning and we see that they're things we don't like, the parables then become not just authoritative but upsetting. It, they're going to be upsetting one way or another. There's at least a couple ways they'll be upsetting. One, they might just upset your world. They might turn your world upside down, flip reality on its head in the way that you think, in the way that you live, in the way that you relate. Here's an example from Jesus' teaching. In Mark chapter 10 and verse 42, we read this. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. You guys don't need people to tell you that, right? Like you have jobs, you go to work, you have circles, P 
peers in your school. You understand how strata of society work. You understand that if there's someone who has a position over you, they kind of like to let you know that they're in a position over you and you're down there, right? That's the way the world works. The disciples were thinking, well, if that's the way the world works, that must be the way the kingdom works as well. And so let's get close to Jesus and be at the beginning of the kingdom so that we can be near him on the throne and we can be exalted and have it easy. And Jesus is about to upset their world. Look at what he says. But it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. This kind of explains why the outsiders stay the outsiders, right? If you're already the powerful, the religious, the elite, if you're the one with influence and position and wealth, you don't want your world upset. I like things just the way they are. Parables will either upset your world or they'll just upset you. Matthew 21, verse 45. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables... So we, we, a lot of times parables get sold as nice stories, like quaint little stories that everyone loves. That's fair. A lot of them are. But each one of the gospel writers includes this note, that something in Jesus' parables, when they heard it, they hated it, and they turned to try to kill him. When they perceived that he was speaking about them, oh, that's when the trouble comes. Although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. This is going to be the beginning of the end in Holy Week for Jesus. They are against him. Now that begs a question too, right? Because the the, the opponents perceived that he was speaking about them. And in our passage, it says they're supposed to not perceive or, or, or not understand. So what's really happening here? We need to think carefully about what the understanding is that Jesus is calling us to. Sometimes when, when we think about the outsiders not understanding, we might think about it in the categories of like Charlie Brown, for those of you who are old enough to remember Charlie Brown. Remember the adults, whenever the adults would speak and it's the voice, like wah, 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 and they don't understand anything. So, so Jesus isn't saying, I'm like the adults in Charlie Brown. Jesus, Jesus is saying they'll understand the words. If they stick around long enough to listen, they'll understand the words, but they'll hate it. It won't sink in and change them. If they really understood it, if they really received it the way I want them to receive it, if they really believed it, what does he say? Lest they turn and be forgiven. They would turn and be forgiven. The proof of the lack of perception, lack of understanding, lack of reception, lack of belief is that they don't turn. So these parables, they're they're these riddle-like sayings that reveal the truth about the kingdom. They reveal the truth about us. They're an authoritative word from a king about his kingdom. They're going to upset our world or they're going to upset us. What does all this mean? If we want the grace to come in, we need to come humbly to receive his word for what it is. It's authoritative. And he calls us to submit. His grace comes to us as we receive his word for what it is. But secondly, his grace comes to me. It comes to me as I come to Christ with empty hands. Come to Christ with empty hands. Not not bringing anything. Not offering anything. See, the disciples come, and, and like we said, the difference between them and the outsiders is they come and they ask, and I'm glad they asked, because I, I mean, some of you are smart. So some of you are probably like, hey, listen, um, I would get this parable. I don't know what's wrong with the disciples. It seems very clear what each one of the soils is. I understand. I could interpret these things. I'm better than them. Well, that's fine for you. I don't think I would have understood. It, 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 you know, you're, you're like those people who, um, you know, you read the answers at the back of the textbook, and then you go and do the homework, and you're like, homework's easy. yeah. Not at all. That's not true. Uh, think about this. If, if, let's, let's put it in a contemporary example. So we're in, uh, we're in Simcoe County. It's uh, almost July, but that means we're about three months away from snow. So let's think about snow for a second. <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I came up here, everybody's doing the math. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. If I came up here this morning and said snow falls on Simcoe County, so some of it falls on the lake hits the water, and immediately it, it disappears. It's gone. 
Some falls on your front lawn. Well, that's nice. It makes it nice and pretty. You can take some photos before Christmas. It's lovely. But then the sun does what the sun does. It warms up the ground and the, the snow melts and it, and it disappears and it's gone. Some snow is going to fall on the road out here where there's like heavy traffic and the plows are going to come by and they're going to push it to the side and then all the cars are going to idle at the intersection and the snow is going to turn black and crusty. It'll still be there, but it's not snow. I don't know what that stuff even is. But some snow, some snow is going to fall on the Zamboni pile out back of the rink. And that thing's going to keep getting added to the whole winter long. It'll be there next July. And then I just get down and go walk away. You're like, what was that guy talking about? It doesn't make sense without the explanation. You need an explanation. So the disciples ask, and I'm glad they did. Jesus is going to help us to understand what it is that he's talking about. He says this. He makes it clear for us. Verse 14. The sower sows the word. So God's grace comes to me as I receive his word for what it is, which I need to receive with empty hands, but what is the word? James helps us out with this image. In James chapter one, he he talks about receiving the implanted word which is able to give us life, give life to our souls, save our souls. In 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter also talks about the seed. He talks about the seed that we've received, the imperishable seed that, that grows in us and comes up, that brings eternal life in us. And Peter defines it. He says this good news, this seed, this, this seed that was preached, the seed that you've received is the good news that was preached to you. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this all of a sudden starts to make sense for us, right? Because if there's an authoritative king who speaks and demands that you humble yourself and listen and receive his truth, realize that that same authoritative king first got off his throne and humbled himself and came and took on our flesh. He knows our sorrows. He's acquainted with our grief. He's experienced the affliction of this life. If he calls you authoritatively to leave behind sin, it's because he first came mercifully to take your sin on himself and bear it on a cross. If he calls you to leave behind things that you love and people that you love and old habits and ways of living, it's because he left behind the throne room of heaven and the worship of angels from all eternity past to come and be spat on and mocked and beaten and bruised for us. See, the king who calls us to receive his word, to come under his authority, is a king who loves you enough to die for you, who left heaven to come and to seek and to save you. If he calls you to come with empty hands, it's because his hands were stretched out first for you on a cross. And he takes those hands and he spreads the seeds and he calls you wherever you are to come be part of my kingdom. Receive forgiveness. Receive life. Let my life enter into you that you would turn and be forgiven and live To receive this seed, you need to come with empty hands, come ready to receive. But this parable shows us some of us won't come at all. Some won't come at all. Verse 15, these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, they hear the preaching of the gospel, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. This is the shortest explanation. It's the shortest image, shortest explanation. It's almost as if Jesus is moving on quickly because they've already stopped listening. And frankly, if this is you, you've probably stopped listening already as well. And I don't have much more to say to you, though I wish I did. The reality in Jesus' own words is simply this. He said, I'm a savior 
who came to forgive sins. If you're righteous and without sin, you don't need me. I'm a doctor who came to heal the sick. If you're not sick, you don't need me. These people hear the message of the gospel and think, I'm fine on my own. They harden their hearts and they walk away. Some won't come at all. Some, some will come, but they come clinging to carefree living. They're trying to hold on to something in this world while trying to come to Jesus at the same time. In verse 16, these are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. They have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. Easy come, easy go. The word comes to them and it sparks joy and it seems like this is great. This is going to give me the life I wanted. This is going to make an easy, happy life for me. But when the word brings persecution and trouble and tribulation, they let go of the word to cling to the carefree life that they are pursuing. And the, the tragedy th that is this, it's like, it's like Jonah in the boat. Do you remember Jonah's in the boat and the sailors and the storm is raging all around and the sailors are like, what do we have to do to stop the storm? It's like, well, the storm's coming because of Jonah. You throw Jonah overboard, the storm will stop. And that's true, and they did, and the storm stopped. And these people think the word, the word is what's in my boat right now that's causing the storm, so let me get rid of that. I'll abandon the gospel and I will be able to live a carefree life again. And the tribulation and the persecution will stop. but you'll have lost your life in the process. Immediately they receive it, immediately they drop it, because they didn't know. The path of Jesus is not a path of carefree living. Your life in Christ will be hard. If you're considering Christianity, you're considering following Jesus and receiving this kingdom, receiving the life in yourself. Understand this. It's going to feel like the, the thorn to rose petal ratio is all off a lot of times. Life is hard in this world as it is. As a Christian, it gets harder. And, and people will make you feel like you don't belong in this world because, frankly, you don't. And whether it's the subtle messaging in advertisements and movies and TV shows, the culture of your workplace or the friend groups at school, whatever the case may be, it will be constantly communicated to you that you don't belong, you're backwards, you're the outsider, you're a menace, you're a threat, and we don't like you. That will not go away. And it will never get easy. Those of us who've been Christians for a long time. We know people in this category, right? Like, uh, when I was younger, you know, theology student, whatever, you're reading the Bible, you're getting excited about theology, and so you read passages like this, and you start thinking about theological abstracts. Let's think about theological concepts, and, and the, the, the sovereignty of God and election, or the perseverance of the saints, or can people lose their salvation? And you start asking all these big questions, and you have fun thinking about theological questions, and then you get older, and all of a sudden, it's not a broad theological question. It's the person that I love down the road for me at church, it's my spouse, it's my kids, it was my parents, it was my cousin, it was my friend, it was someone that I love that's no longer here anymore. And so we commit them to prayer and we lament and we wonder aloud with God. We bear them on our hearts. Can I tell you one response that should not be allowed from us though? When people apostatize or leave the, leave the faith, the response should never be surprise. Because thousands of years ago, Jesus told us this would happen. Sometimes we're surprised at the who, but the what should never surprise us. Some of us hear these words about people not making it, and we, we think in theological categories. Some of us think about loved ones who, who, who we know and are praying and are bearing on our heart. But let me press you. If I can press you a little bit more, just a little bit deeper, because there's something even more urgent than that, and it's this. 
Jesus didn't tell this parable for theological nerds. And he didn't tell this parable for you to think about your loved ones. He told this parable so that you could look at yourself and say, how am I listening? Am I receiving? Or what am I clinging to in this world? What of this carefree life am I still holding on to that's going to be the seed, that's going to be the beginning, not of life, but of apostasy? How are you hearing the word in your life right now? What are you clinging to that you're hoping will just make life easier? It can choke and it can kill. Some are clinging to the carefree life. Some are clutching to the cares of the world. Again, it's this image, right? Jesus, Jesus in verse 20 is saying that the ones who receive the word and bear fruit are the ones who can receive it, which means you have empty hands to receive something. But these ones have something not just in their hands, but they're clutching and close to their chest. What is it? Verse 18, other ones, others are the ones sown among thorns. They're those who hear the word, but cares of the world deceitfulness of riches and desires for other things. That's a lot, right? It's a lot. It's a big category. They enter in and choke the word and it proves unfruitful. Can I tell you why we're in trouble? We're in trouble because our enemy knows that as much as we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven, we also still live on planet earth and there's bills to be paid. Monday morning's coming, your job is stressful. The world outside doesn't look like it's getting any easier or any happier. Like everything is hard. Just see, I don't know if it's just because I'm getting old, I'm tired all the time, I don't know. But it seems like everything's getting harder, right? Like I, I went to McDonald's the other day and they wouldn't even give me a refill. And I'm like, how is McDonald's hard right now? Like this is, McDonald's is supposed to be the definition of easy. It just feels like everything's kind of piling up on us, right? Like the weight of everything. Everything is hard. And that's where the deceit enters in because we think, oh, I just need something to make it a little bit easier. If I could just get a promotion, if I could just get a bit more money, if I could just get in with that friend group, if I could just make my social profile look a little bit better, if I could just, 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 whatever it is, no matter if it's good or bad or whatever the thing, but we pin our hopes on that and pursue that, not abandoning the gospel, but just like, okay, the gospel's over there. I never denied it but really I'm looking for life in these things. But we're in even more trouble than that. Because you people, like me, are people that come here every week and sit in these chairs. And so we're not just tempted to pick up and fill our hands and cling to our chest the things that the world does. But the things that seem to promise life in the church, my standing in the church community, I, I, can't, I can't come with empty hands. I gotta look like I've got something. I'm serving in this way. I'm participating in that ministry. I'm, I'm this type of small group member. I, I'm feeding my kids these things. Our, we're disciplining our kids that way. We're doing this routine, that routine, whatever it is that's gonna make you look good in the church community. We cling, we clutch, we build up, we pile, and we carry all of it with ch- to church with us with a smile on our face, and it crushes us. And it chokes us so we don't just come with empty hands and receive. And we're not built up. Satan knows the ways he can tempt us and test us. But Jesus has made clear what he wants. He wants you to come to him to be Mary, not Martha, sitting at his feet and receiving He wants you to come and be the child that he welcomes on his lap. It was nothing to give, not the rich young ruler who comes and says, I'm here to bless. If your hands are full of anything, it will stop you from receiving the word of God that brings his grace and makes us insiders that welcomes us into his kingdom. If I want that grace, I gotta come. I gotta come to receive his word for what it is, which means I need to receive it with empty hands, which lastly, how do I receive this grace? I come to treasure the word like my life depends on it. (laughs) Come to treasure it like my life depends on it because my life does depend on it. 
The ongoing grace in a Christian's life is received the exact same way that saving grace came into a Christian's life, which is we just come back to Jesus. Verse 20. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. You know how prone the human heart is to obsess on works or like value added or what I can bring or what I can offer? I'm like studying to, to, to preach this passage, thinking about it, thinking about it, meditating on it, I still come back to it and read, and read at the end, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. I want to do that. I want to bear fruit. Where do I bear fruit? Am I bearing fruit? The fruit is the difference. It's all about the fruit. What do I have to do to bear fruit? And right away, I'm immediately filling up my hands with all the things that I need to do. Do you remember how Jesus started? I made a big, I made a big deal about this. Listen, <laughs> behold, let him who has ears to hear, hear. This is the one who receives we're going to live by receiving, not by giving. The fruit, the fruit comes from the seed. I hear this and I'm like, I want to be the good soil. So what does that mean? That means I need to somehow be the type of soil that produces fruit in myself. No, that is wrong. I need to be the soil that just receives and treasures like verse 20 again, these are the ones who hear. Now you can't pick this up in English, which I hate. I hate this about translation. But when Jesus is teaching each one of the, the soils that he describes, he uses somewhat of a past tense, a, a, a singular action type tense that basically says they heard the word, they heard the word. But when he comes to the ones who receive it here in verse 20, they're those who hear in an ongoing sense. They're the ones who hear and continue to hear the word. And they receive it. But the word for receive is not the usual word in the New Testament for receive. It's a word that could be better translated welcome, which like maybe you picture it this way. Picture your kids have been away for a little while. Maybe they're at university or something and they're coming back at the end of a semester. They're, they're coming back for Christmas and they've been gone and they walk in the front door and you're watching TV and you're just sitting on the couch changing the channels or whatever you do and you don't get up. Hi, welcome. No, it's not like that at all, right? What do you do? You get up, you fling the door open. You've probably already made food. You're excited. You welcome them in. This is a word for welcome. The, the ones who are the good soil, Jesus says, this is the ones who continue to hear and welcome Welcome and treasure and coddle that seed so that the seed brings the fruit. How we stay in is how we got in. It's all his grace that comes to us in the gospel, which we receive convictionally. I need this grace. We receive consistently. I need this grace every day. I need to be reminded every day how many of us have all kinds of things that we talked to our therapists about growing up? Because growing up, we didn't hear the things that we needed to hear over and over again, right? Because we know, as humans, how many of us have issues in our marriages because the person is not telling you the things that you need to hear over and over again. We're people who need to hear the truth again and again in every context of our lives. It's the same with the gospel. We need it convictionally. We need it consistently. And we need it carefully. Ask yourself, do you believe? Do you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ? That his grace has come to you. That his blood has washed you. That you've been made clean. That you've been accepted. That you've been redeemed. Do you you believe that heart? Do you believe that today? If you do, if you receive that word, it will bear fruit. Fruit that resembles the seed. The fruit is organically connected to the seed, right? If you plant an acorn, I'm pretty sure it grows into an oak. It is directly connected, the one to the other. And the fruit that we look for in our lives is fruit that's directly connected to the word, the person, and the message of Jesus Christ. What does bearing fruit look like? Well, if it's Jesus that's planted in me, it's Jesus that grows out of me. And so the spirit of Jesus in me works in me the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. See, the fruit that we're looking for here is it's not so much quit your job so that you can go preach the gospel on the street. It's go to your job and bring love. It's not so much leave your family to go be a missionary. 
It's simply be the peace of Christ in your home. Not so much sell all your possessions and and live a life of radical sworn poverty, but handle your money with self-control and humility and goodness that looks like Jesus. So that in a million different ways, each and every day as we wake up and do our life and go to bed, Christ is sprouting out of us in every area of our life. That word, if received, will bring fruit. And maybe you've lived long enough as a Christian, like we said, to see others not make it. Maybe you've lived long enough as a Christian like me to wonder if you're actually the one that's not going to make it. How do we know? What do we go to? We remember this precious truth. We didn't get in because of what we brought. And we won't stay in because of what we bring. We're in only ever and always because of what we receive. The gift of the grace of Jesus Christ, crucified for us, who loved us enough to die for us and ever lives to intercede for us, the one who is and always will be faithful and will keep us to the end. So that the secret of the kingdom of God is that the insiders, we're no better than outsiders. We're no different. We've just received the seed. And we let Jesus do his work in us. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you acknowledging with all the backgrounds, all the life situations, all the burdens, the sin that clings so closely. You know all the things that we are so prone to fill our hands with all the righteous deeds that we want to do so that others will see or so that we think will be accepted. Pray that you would give us grace in this moment to empty our hands, to let go, and to simply receive the good news of Jesus Christ crucified for me, raised for my justification, the one who gave me hope, gives me hope, and will sustain me until the day when my hope becomes reality. Give us grace to turn to abandon, to leave all that we need to leave. Give us grace to humble ourselves and simply receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. And let that seed do its work in us, whatever that is. We pray in Jesus' name.